All right, let's get started. Thank you all so much for joining our panel on how to start and sustain a GSA. My name is Frederick. My pronouns are they, them. Um, I am Out Youth Texas Gender and Sexuality Alliance Network Coordinator, and I'll be moderating our chat today. Um, I'm super stoked to have this conversation with all of our amazing panelists. Um, and uh, before we jump in, we do need to acknowledge that we're coming to you from the land of the Tonkawa tribe and the Comanche Nation in Austin, Texas. Um, if you don't know whose land you're on, this link that I'm sharing in the chat is a great place to find out. And let me make sure that this will go to everybody. Oh, that is not the link. Let's see. So there is that for y'all. Um, <clears throat> We also just want to take a moment to acknowledge the work and struggle and pain and success of Black, Indigenous, and people of color communities across the continent. Um, so many of the rights that we hold dear today, including the right to love who we want and express ourselves in the ways that are true to us, come from generations of BIPOC activists, um, and we have a responsibility to carry on their work to fight for everyone to be able to live fearless and authentic lives. Um, to start with today, we'll have each of our brilliant panelists introduce themselves. Um, so let's do uh, name, pronouns, school, grade, and school district. And our two opening questions will be, what was the state of the GSA club when you first attended your school? Um, and <clears throat> what made you want to participate in a GSA? Um, so I will first turn it over to E. Smith. Um, e is the um, founder of many wonderful things. Uh, most importantly for today, the founder of Queering Education. Um, so I will pass it over to y'all. Hi, uh, I'm E. I use they, them pronouns. Uh, yes, as Frederick said, I'm the founder of Queering Education. I'm also the founder and president of the Central Texas Genders and Sexualities Alliance Coalition, which brings together GSAs from all across the Austin area. We have members from about 40 schools now. Um, and Let's see, I did my name, my pronouns. Uh, I just graduated from Cedar Ridge High School, which is a public school in Round Rock ISD. Um, I'll be attending Harvard University in the fall. Um, when I entered high school, my GSA had been dormant for about three years. Um, so I, st I started in 2016. The GSA had sort of died down by 2013. So I restarted the GSA and uh, when when I graduated, so we started zero members since it didn't exist, and when I graduated, we had 54. So, yeah, I don't remember if there was another question, <laughs> but if there was not, I'm going to go ahead and pass it on over to Zoe. So, the, before, we, before we get to you, Zoe, but <laughs> the last question was, um, what made you want to participate in a GSA? Oh, got it, yes. Um, I just really wanted community and friends who were queer and trans. Um, I was sort of just starting to understand my identity. Like I had known that I wasn't straight for a really long time, but I didn't have the language to describe it. Um, and so I was hoping that having a GSA club would allow me to have like resources and a community of people who would help me navigate that. I'm Zoe Odolinsky. I'm a rising senior at Lake Travis High School and I use she, her pronouns. Uh, I, when I first came into my GSA, the website hadn't been updated for years. We had about eight members and it was mostly just a social GSA where people met up once every two weeks to talk. Um, we now have 13 members. We're still small, but we are growing. And uh, I'm very proud to say we now host speakers throughout the school year and we didn't get to towards the end of this year. Um, and then I've also forgotten the second question. I'm so sorry. No problem at all. Uh, what made you want to participate in a GSA in the first place? Uh, well, I'm a homebound student, so I don't get to participate in clubs very often uh, due to chronic migraines. So when I saw that I could join the GSA and participate through video calls, I was very excited, even though, as I said, the website hadn't been updated. Um, and when I first talked to our advisor, she just asked, would you be interested in being co-president? And I said, sure, that would be great. And I'm just, I'm really happy I got the chance to be part of something and, you know, make things better for the club. 
Awesome. Thanks. Um, Leo, do you want to go next? Uh, hi, my name is Leo Heinrich. I uh, recently graduated from Westlake High School and I'm going to American University in the fall of next year. Uh, when I first start, went to my GSA, it averaged about two to three members. And after kind of my time there, we averaged about closer to 20. I wanted to join the GSA because it was such a unique space in my school. We had nothing else like it where just members of the queer community could come together and just be who they are and just be accepted. And it was something I felt needed to be progressed. Awesome. Did I forget anything? Uh, what are your pronouns, Leo? Oh, he, him, or they, them. <laughs> Thank you. Shira? Hi, I'm Shira. Um, I'm a rising senior at Griffin School in Austin. It's a private school. Um, I use she, her, or they, them pronouns. Um, I, uh, when I first came to my school, um, my freshman year was the year that my GSA was founded. Um, and so it was super new to the school, even though it was already like an accepting community for um, queer youth, but it was like this new and exciting thing. And I didn't join until my sophomore year just because I was like worried, I was nervous. Um, but then it, um, going into my junior year, I was asked by the leaders who were graduating if I would um, be one of the co-leaders for the um, for the next year and so yeah awesome fantastic thanks y'all um so let's move into the chewy center of our discussion today um i know we've talked about this a little bit already um so but if there's anything y'all want to add um how has your school's gsa changed over your time there um, I know we talked a little bit about like membership and numbers and things like that. Um, are there other important ways that it changed in your time there as a leader? Um, in my experience, it's honestly lost a little bit of its traction um, because it was founded by two seniors at the time and then passed down to two more seniors. Um, and then me and now a rising junior and many of the members graduated throughout the years and we didn't gain a whole lot back um, partially because people didn't come to the like advertising events for all the clubs and so they didn't really know what it was and um, because the name of the club at my school is quilt bag people didn't really understand like that it was a GSA um, and so just the lack of advertising and um, the leaders being busy throughout the entire year. It just didn't have um, as many people, but we plan to have more of that and more activities to um, attract people in next year. Yeah, I think my club has also shifted quite a bit over the years. Um, so we have gone through a lot of changes in uh, sponsorship. So we call our teacher advisors for our clubs at our schools, we call them sponsors. Um, and so we've, over the course of my four years in high school, we've had 10 different sponsors. And I think with each person, sort of the direction of the club kind of changes a lot. Um, and so our original sponsors were really involved in the community and really focused on like political activism. You know, they had all been involved in like letter writing campaigns in the past. Um, and that was great. So when we started, we did a lot of uh, focus on like advocating for change within the Texas legislature and stuff. Um, and that was awesome. But now our current sponsor is really involved like in the queer community and just, you know, doing things uh, more socially and culturally. So we have a lot more focus on that, more focus on like, let's have a drag show or let's do this, that or the other. Um, and so I think there's definitely been a shift from like, this is activism club to like, we're just queer and we do activism. Like we have voter registration drives, we have education campaigns, we still do letter writing, um, but it's definitely gotten like more fun and more cultural. Um, and so I don't know if that's necessarily a positive or a negative, but there's definitely been a change. Um, as I said earlier, we started with fewer members and although we are still small, we are growing. Uh, we've started inviting and hosting speakers and workshops, such as Louise Rosen from the Anti-Defamation League. That was one of our most popular events. 
Um, we're also hoping to get gender neutral bathrooms for students in our school from some of the unused teacher bathrooms. Uh, we're hoping to participate in Band Book Week next week, uh, next year, <laughs> not next week, um, next year, and participate with the library for that. I think the biggest change I saw primarily with uh, my GSA was partially size. I think the biggest thing that kind of made it work is that it was just making sure that everybody who could know about it and who wanted to attend could. And uh, we started having speakers come in. That was a new thing. Um, we just started kind of making it feel more like a club, if that made sense. Initially, it was just me and my friends. And while we were a big club my freshman year, there was a mass outing and everybody left. So I had to set up some policies, make sure that I, the district would handle it if something like that were to happen again. But that was probably the biggest change I saw throughout my entire time at Westlake. Thanks, Leo. That's a great uh, segue to our next question. Um, how do do y'all as leaders and how does your GSA maintain um, club member safety and confidentiality? Um, Leo, it sounds like you have a lot of experience with this particular issue. So if you want to talk to us about what happened and like how y'all handled it, that would be awesome. Okay. Um, when I was in the GSA for my first year, I actually was not in leadership just then. It was different leadership, different people showing up. And when I uh, became vice president, I got official forms for a no adding policy that you had to sign. So you were having confirmation that I'm not going to say anything unless somebody explicitly states they're out outside of the club. And also I was very close to people in the school administration and also my APs and all of that. So that was how we were going to handle it out. My freshman year, when I first started the club, we didn't really have any accountability measures in place. Um, and so some things went wrong. It was a problem. Um, but we learned from our mistakes and we fixed things. So sophomore year, I wrote up bylaws. And then um, at the beginning of every year, we have officer elections. And so during that time, we also, as a club, sat down and wrote a set of club norms. Um, and they were pretty standard, like, things, I don't know, for any of you who have ever been part of like a youth group or anything else, you've probably had something similar of like, uh, you know, we maintain confidentiality in this space, except in the instance where there's potential harm to someone, or, you know, we're not going to out anyone, we'll respect and listen to everyone's opinions. If you disagree with it, that's fine, but be respectful in your disagreement, you know, all of that kind of stuff. Um, and then in our bylaws, we have sort of a a two strike policy that's also sort of flexible. <laughs> um, so, you know, if there is an issue that arises within the club, um, if someone brings that to either my attention or our GSA sponsor's attention, then we'll talk it through with each person individually. If they want to talk together in like a mediated context, then we'll, you know, we'll facilitate that. Um, and then that the person who caused harm in that scenario is allowed to come back to the club. Um, but then if there's another instance, then we will remove that person from the club and they're no longer welcome at GSA meetings. Um, and I think that's a really great way for us at least to maintain accountability because most people who come to GSA want to be there. Um, but, you know, we also want to ensure that it's a safe space. So it makes it fair and equitable. And yeah. We haven't run into any problems with that yet, um, but we are looking at our code of conduct to uh, include that in our code of conduct and to start using the uh, ten Texas GSA Network's confidentiality agreement. Um, towards the beginning of the year, when people are kind of filtering in and hearing about the club, um, we make sure to let them know the intentions and that it's a, um, there to provide a sp safe space. And so anything that could be personal or private or serious in any way um, must stay within the club and that anyone who violates it, violates it is either not welcome or will be taken to um, our student-led responsibility committee um, where they kind of mediate disciplinary action. Um, but so far we've not had any issues with privacy. Awesome, thanks y'all. 
Um, you also answered one of the other questions I had, uh, which was how do you handle a bad apple? Um, it sounds like y'all have some awesome like different mediation strategies and different um, tools that you can use depending on your school and your district on how to deal with all of that. Um, so let's go to something more fun. Um, <laughs> what does the student leadership in your GSA look like? Um, do y'all vote on presidents? Are you appointed? Is it a hierarchy? Is it consensus based? What kind of leadership structure do y'all have? Um, and if you want to share, how do you feel about the leadership structure y'all have in your clubs? Okay, so for how we do it at my club, when I first joined, I had nobody else who could lead at that moment because I was the only person who was left behind, so automatically assigned president. But when we got more people coming in, what we did is that we would have elections and every person who was running, typically whoever was vice president would become president just because of experience. But for vice president campaigns, they would have an entire PowerPoint slide about why they should be elected, and then we could kind of weigh the pros and cons, and that's how we choose it. I feel like it works pretty well. It gives a way to kind of show previous leadership, ideas that they want to implement, stuff like that. And then people can vote based off of whatever they think is most important to them. Um, at my school, we, for most of the like major committees that are student led, um, we do have elections twice a year, but for clubs like the GSA and any other one, um, you basically just, ask um, somebody when you step out of your position or graduate to take your place. Um, but the leadership itself in the GSA, it's pretty much 100% student led. Um, we do also have a teacher sponsor because that's just required for any club. But um, we mostly just need them to like reserve the room and approve of activities um, and ask for like resources for future meetings. But the meetings themselves are always planned and led by the students. Uh, we currently have a co-presidency uh, and no other uh, organized structure. We're working towards uh, elections next year, so that way we can prepare the next group of leaders in our club. Uh, and I'm hoping to set up a treasury department, so hopefully we'll have a treasurer and maybe a vice president. And we are moving to presidencies. president, a vice president, a secretary, a treasurer, um, a webmaster, and an art director, and the art director leads an art committee. Um, and so it, it, it's somewhat functional. Like the, the system needs some work, but the next generators will work to fix it. Um, we have elections every year. So will run for positions. Uh, most people make or like give a speech or something uh, and then we distribute paper ballots so that people can vote anonymously. We have our teacher sponsor count the ballot. Um, and so that's been the way that our structure works. It's been a little bit difficult to um, ensure that everyone knows what their duties are and that they're fulfilling them um, and to hold them accountable when they don't you know do their job or whatever. Uh, so that's something we've been struggling with. But one thing that I've really enjoyed is having that art director in the art committee, because um, we always need a poster or like a trifold for a club fair or something. And so having that has been awesome, because it's just like, hey, we need four different posters. Go, do your thing. And like, people love art, and they pull out the markers, and it's awesome. So I really like that part of our leadership structure. Awesome. Thanks, y'all. Um, what kind of events that y'all have put together have been most successful? I know a couple of y'all have mentioned that you've brought in speakers. I know I've spoken at a couple of y'all's um, GSA meetings. Um, what, yeah, what kind of events have you done that have been successful? Um, speakers definitely are, um, have been very successful bringing in hands-on activities. So for example, for Valentine's Day, um, we brought in like a bunch of art supplies and had people make little Valentine's Day cards um, for people at the school and like hand them out. Um, and any event will be successful if you bring food. <laughs> um, yeah, I definitely have to agree with the food comment. Um, every single meeting we had always brought chocolate chip cookies for a reason. Um, but the most successful ones, I brought in speakers from the ACLU to talk about LGBT rights and the rights you have in the school system. 
And this was probably, I can't say I will always recommend this as a practice because paint got everywhere. But for the first ever opening one, we did a Bob Ross painting party so everyone could just kind of chill out and get to know each other. And it was great, but it was kind of messy. So I would definitely say that. Anything that's hands-on gets people involved, gets people talking to each other about stuff. It always works out really well. So far, we've really only been able to host speakers and workshops like the Anti-Defamation League one, um, but those have definitely been popular. It's what's brought in members so far. And we do have plans for next year, like movie nights once a month to bring in more people. We've also had movie nights. Um, I think my favorite one was freshman year. We watched David Bowie's Labyrinth and it was great. We had like popcorn and sweets and we all sat on the floor and watched David Bowie and it was amazing. Uh, and then I think our most popular event every year is the Day of Silence. Um, so last year we had over like a prize drawing and pizza and stuff after school and it was rad. Um, so that's always fun. We host voter registration drives multiple times a year um, and so that's really good just to like make sure everyone has access to register to vote we walk them through the process tell them like when they're gonna get their voter registration card in the mail and all of that also everyone watching please vote please do it um, yeah so we do that we uh, decorate the library for band books week and that's fun um, and we also participate in our school's homecoming parade every year uh, so we decorate the back of a pickup truck we have one Pride flags and balloons and the mini pride parade. Awesome. Y'all's clubs sound super fun. Um, what, um, what kind of activism or advocacy work has your club done? Um, and additionally, what kind of activism and advocacy work do you feel like your school needs your club to be doing? We're uh, trying to get gender neutral bathrooms made out of unused teacher bathrooms in our school. And we had a meeting with our principal set for the end of this year, but due to the quarantine, we haven't been able to have that meeting yet. We're hoping to do it at the beginning of next year, either in person or as a video call. And then also we're hoping to participate in Band Book Week just to raise awareness about how many books are challenged due to LGBTQ content, which it was eight out of 10 last year for the top 10. Um, so that's what we've been doing. Something that um, really sticks out to me is when we brought in our history teacher to talk about the Supreme Court case. Um, and it was really good because um, while everyone in the uh, club is like, they're, they're very open to like learning and hearing about it. A lot of them just didn't know about this and didn't know it existed. Um, and so it was really good to get that little bit of education that they wouldn't get in another class. Along with the voter registration drive um, I mentioned before, we also do a lot of trainings on just like how to call politicians or how to do like letter writing or whatever. Um, and so we do that and and get in touch or advocate for this issue if there's anything like really important coming up that relates to the LGBTQ community. Um, we've also done a couple professional development trainings for teachers at my school of just like how to support LGBTQ plus students. Um, we advocate for individual students. So like if someone needs help getting their name changed with the school or something, um, we help them with that. Uh, and then last year, we also, well, it's been like a multiple year process of uh, getting safe space signs in schools. Um, and so, yeah, that's what our advocacy kind of looks like. I don't know if you necessarily can call what I've been doing mostly in my year advocacy because I had a bunch of events planned and then they got canceled due to Corona because I was initially planning a protest for the Supreme Court decisions that were going, luckily turned out in our favor uh, this June. But my biggest thing that I tried to do was just make sure people could get educated on LGBT rights, the rights we had in the school system, and also uh, trying to just make sure that people knew what was happening in the queer community in the legislative and also just in general. So every meeting starts with gay news. We talk about things that most people can't look up otherwise because a lot of people were closeted within the GSA initially. And just making sure that people know 
what they can do, what they can do to just get more active within the community itself. Fantastic. Um, what other clubs have y'all worked with um, and what have you worked on with them? Um, we haven't formally like collaborated with another, but we've talked to the film club and we tried to plan watching um, an LGBTQ plus oriented movie, though that didn't happen because we were just busy at different times. Um, and we've also talked to our diversity and equity council to discuss different types of activities and kind of like bounce ideas off of each other um, to make things both like fun and engaging and also um, educational and productive. Um, and we also, this isn't really like a committee or club or anything, but we talked or we worked a lot with the um, administrators of the school because um, my GSA founded homecoming at my school and we've planned it every year um, since my freshman year. Um, and so it's been, it's been helpful having um, teachers in support of that. We've partnered with my school's Girl Up Club, which is um, like an intersectional feminism club that was started by the UN. And it's like there are branches of Girl Up in a lot of schools across the country. Um, and so we have that. And uh, we just as a GSA went to a couple of Girl Up meetings and just talked about like queer issues within feminism. Um, and so that was cool. We've partnered with the UNICEF Club um, and that was just sort of about like service and also talking about LGBT rights around the world because uh, there are still places where you can face the death penalty for being gay. Um, and then for a little while we had a diversity club, um, but then our principal disbanded, but the GSA was part of that uh, until it ended. So yeah, that's what we've done. We haven't worked with any clubs so far, but we are hoping to work with our school's library or the community library, if it's possible, um, for Band Book Week, and maybe the Global Cultures Club we have at our school, which would be interesting. Um, I don't know if you would technically call this partnering as much, but our club were, was really close with the East Asian Cultures Club at my school, and we used to have group meetings together to just discuss whatever we wanted to at that point. It was more or less just a matter of enlarging community at that point. That's awesome. And Leo, you are so good at like segueing us to the next question. Um, <laughs> how do you bring in uh, straight cis allies to your club? Um, this is actually something that was very important to our GSA in particular because we really did want to bring in people who were just straight allies or just curious about coming in. Our club had club fair. Um, well, we had a table at club fair that was set up and this is going to sound odd, but if you bring like cookies or like juice or anything like that to your table or just something to kind of cause intrigue, people will come over and be like, I'm an ally, but I don't know if I can come to the GSA because is, is it for straight people? And I said, of course, I mean, straight's in the name, so please come over. It's more or less just making a welcoming community that anybody would feel okay in and just happening to discuss queer issues and just being kind of a mixture of safe spaces. Yeah, we have a similar thing um, specifically for clubs. It's just called Club Lunch. Um, and all the clubs just set up a table and we also brought cookies, which brought in people to sign up um, to get emails. Um, and when like you're advertising or telling people about the club, um, we make sure to tell them it's for everyone and they're just as welcome regardless of their place in the LGBTQ community and advertise it more as a safe space for everyone that simply focuses on LGBTQ plus related topics um, and is like geared towards them, but like absolutely welcomes anyone. I think posters that clearly state you don't have to be in the LGBTQ community, you just have to be an ally in order to join the club are very helpful. Uh, they've been helpful to us before and uh, I really like them. I think also events like movie night help bring in just people who are interested in seeing a movie and eventually become allies. 
We have people, um, so people are always welcome to like come to the club whenever, but we do have specific like bring a friend days. Um, and so that's been the main way that we've gotten allies to join. Like people will just bring their cool straight friend and woo, now we have allies in the club. Um, and our day of silence is also kind of a good way for us to get allies in as well. Um, just because that's such a big event, so many people get involved and then they're curious about the group that led it and so they come to GSA meetings. And so those would probably be our two main ways that we've gotten allies to join. Awesome. Um, so let's see, our next question. Um, what do you want and need from a GSA advisor? I think just a GSA advisor that's willing to advocate for their members, I think that's just the best thing you can have in an advisor. Also somebody who knows the rules and can communicate them clearly to the leadership so that they can get things done. Um, someone who has or can get like resources, meaning like speakers, teachers, activities, et cetera. Um, and someone who will let the students do the leading and acts as mostly like the enabler and provider for um, a space and activities and stuff. And someone who won't try to like step over you and take over when it's like intentionally student led. Uh, I definitely agree with allowing the students to kind of lead. You have the biggest thing from GSA that I got is that I developed a style of leadership that I hadn't before. And I think the biggest thing that I appreciate about my advisor is that really as long as it was school appropriate and as long as it didn't clash with anything the district allowed or didn't allow, then I was allowed to bring speakers and I was allowed to plan events just as long as they worked with whoever uh, was on topic at least. I definitely echo everything they said, like, yes, allow students to lead. Um, and also just don't get in the way. Um, like I've had uh, advisors who have tried to sort of like silence students or just not, they're not helpful. Um, and they make the lives of the student leaders and student members more difficult. Um, and so I think it's important as an advisor that like, you know when to step out of the way. Um, and sometimes students might say things that you think are risky or that you don't agree with. Um, and that's okay, like let them say that. If there are consequences, then you know we can figure out how to navigate that. Um, but I think it's important that GSA advisors don't silence their students and allow them to talk about what's important to them. Awesome, thanks so much for sharing that perspective with us, y'all. I know, um, like as an adult who works with young folks, I know the importance of just listening to what you want and getting out of the way. Um, and there's actually research that backs that up. <laughs> so I'm sharing in the chat, uh, the stories and numbers uh, research brief on what makes a strong GSA advisor. And um, I know y'all heard E mention earlier that their club went through 10 different advisors over the course of four years, which is just astronomical. Um, and one of the things that I would recommend as the Texas GSA network coordinator is for advisors to really be committed to the club. Um, because the longer a GSA advisor is with the club, the more support they're able to offer members, the more they're able to help with that like transition of leadership when students graduate, the more they're able to help with the historical institutional knowledge. Um, and so there really is a place for awesome GSA advisors. Um, and, you know, just listen to what your students tell you they want. <laughs> um, so on the other side of that, um, I would love to know how y'all have dealt with unsupportive teachers, administrators, students, etc. We thankfully only, like, for the most part, had teachers who were super supportive. Um, but someone who is, like, one of the higher up administrators kind of unintentionally tries to silence us or take over even though he's not really involved in the club and so this mostly um there are mostly problems with him in the past years before I was a leader but um they just kind of had to step in and say like you know what we're gonna do this even though you're trying to get us not to because you don't really have a reason not to it's not harming anybody um 
it's an activity we are leading the club we're going to do this and i know that's not possible at every school but because my school is really tiny and so the community is very tight and so we kind of know all the um faculty really well and so they were more comfortable doing that Um, when I was doing uh, GSA, we had had issues with people having homophobia or transphobia in the past, but when I came around, I think some legal actions have been taken at that point already, so teachers went through training, they kind of know what they can and can't do in terms of how they can treat their students, so I never encountered that with teachers. I definitely encountered that with students in my school, and I think the biggest thing is that I just had to stand up for other people when I saw it. I had to tell other people the importance of standing up when they saw it. And also if I could, if I knew the person, uh, I would tell the administration. If I didn't know, I would take a picture, show the picture. They would often pull up the kid's picture and they'd know who it is and then they could handle it. So that's what I would recommend. But I don't know as much for administration personally. I think persistence is the best key to this. Um, just getting in touch at first and being polite. And then if you run into problems, I think just persistence and bringing in extra people if you need to. Don't be afraid to bring in supportive parents to back you or uh, supportive teachers and administrators. Um. So I've got a story, uh, so buckle your seatbelts. Uh, so junior year, my GSA did a panel uh, for all 300 of my school's faculty about just like how to support LGBTQ plus students. Like just how to not be homophobic, how to make sure your students aren't getting bullied in your classroom, you know, very basic stuff. Um, and then my school sent out a feedback survey after the panel. Uh, we got a lot of like really negative feedback. We had teachers say that like, they didn't want to be targeted just because they didn't support the LGBTQ plus community. Um, someone said that like, I don't know, it was a lot, it was real rough, um, but teachers were not comfortable with um, displaying safe space signs outside of their classrooms because, or sorry, I should <laughs> rephrase that. Um, so we suggested that teachers could put safe space signs outside of their classrooms just to indicate that like, this is a supportive place. If you have an issue, you can come talk to me, whatever. Um, and so we had teachers who were opposed to that idea because they didn't want to be targeted for not putting up a sign or whatever. Um, and so in response to all of that pushback, my principal banned rainbows. Um, and she banned any other signs or anything that had to do with members of the LGBTQ plus community. Um, and so at that point, we had already had a few teachers who had safe space signs, uh, but they were forced to take them down. Um, and so I started having so many, so many meetings with friends, with my principal. Um, you know, I printed out like research about the importance of safe space signs. Uh, I had like highlights of the school district policy and Texas state education policy, all of this. Um, and it was just a, it was a really difficult process of just trying to convince my principal that like, no, it's okay. Um, I came to her with a bunch of different plans of like, well, what if we make teachers opt in to do a training and then once they complete the training they can get the sign and she said no to that um and so she was just really opposed to us having a safe space sign because she didn't want to create a divide um and so then i um i got an award from glisten and it was like in the news and it was a thing um, and then I think my principal was like a little, a little scared of that. Uh, and so then she let us host an optional professional development training and all of the teachers who came to that were allowed to display safe space signs. So now we have them. Uh, it took over a year to let teachers have rainbows, but rainbows are unbanned now, which is great. Um, but that was definitely illegal uh, to ban that, like that's, you're not allowed to do that. So there's always the option of suing. HCLU offers like pro bono looking. Um, also, yes, definitely like Zoe said, persistence is important. Uh, just keep going. Um, you know, you can just have a new person come in and meet with the principal every week. Um, and yeah, also clout. <laughs> like if you, if you can get the media, um, if you can get 
I don't know, anything else just to like come in and say, hey, look, what you're doing is wrong. Um, we have a platform here that can make you look bad, that can make this school look bad. Um, like, listen to what we're saying. And it's unfortunate that it has to come to that, but it kind of does at some times when administration just isn't listening to what we had parents come in before, we had other teachers, we had other students, and the administration wasn't listening. So, yeah, that was my. <laughs> uh, that's so frustrating to hear that your principal tried to ban rainbows. Like, what? Uh, um, also, I am a resource for any student throughout the state of Texas. If you are having issues with your administration, with faculty, um, you can always reach out to me. Um, my email is heather, my first name, at txgsa.org. Um, I will put it in the chat right now. Um, and uh, y'all are welcome to reach out to me if you need help with stuff. And then we have two upcoming um, queering education conversations that are related to this. Um, the next one is going to be on, um, so this is not our next session, but um, this is the next one that's specifically related to classroom stuff. Um, so Wednesday the 24th at 6 p.m. Um, there is that one there. And then um, on Thursday the 25th at 1 p.m., we are also gonna um, have a conversation about how to use stories and numbers. And stories and numbers is the um, link that I sent earlier about how to be a good GSA advisor. And so um, it's really uh, science-based, science-backed uh, research about what works in schools to support LGBTQ students. Um, so there are those links in the chat for folks who are interested. Um, and our next question for our amazing panelists, um, what do you wish you had known before you took a leadership position in your club? I mostly, just, sorry. <laughs> I mostly just wish I had known what my club needed. I went in and I didn't know what they wanted from this, if they wanted to continue just being a social GSA. Uh, I also wish I had known more about the procedures and systems in place that you need to go through to start a treasury department for your club or just get things done. I think the biggest thing I needed to figure out was how to kind of lead somebody my own age. I have done leadership projects before. I was used to leading people who are younger than me and I was used to leading people who were a bit older than me and it kind of just understood that everybody has the ability to lead but when it's somebody who's your age or like a year younger there's something kind of different about that dynamic where they don't take you quite as seriously so you kind of have to figure out how to be both uh, everybody's friend and also everybody's leader and be able to lead discussion and talk about important topics without just allowing entire chaos within the room. I wish I had known in my freshman year that it was okay to join as an ally because it wasn't out as anything yet at the time. And so I was just, I felt super out of place every time I was like asked to go to one of the meetings or I would try to go, I would feel like I was obligated to kind of be a part of the LGBTQ community and like out myself. Um, but I just feel like there wasn't enough, um, there, it wasn't as like straightforward as we try to make it now. I wish that I had known the importance of stability when I started. So not only like stability in GSA sponsors, but just like stability in, in a mission or in student leadership or in having like, here are the three events that we're gonna do every year. Um, and this is when we're gonna start planning them. Just kind of having that concrete idea of what should happen within this club. Um, I think that would have been really helpful. I started to develop, we have like a, a big dock of like GSA actions and stuff. Um, and so I started to, to develop that during my junior year. But if um, I had started that process from the beginning, I think it would have been just really helpful in making things go more smoothly with the club. Again, y'all are masters of the segue. Um, <laughs> so uh, the next question is, how are you passing on what you have learned to the student leaders who are coming after you? So E, if you want to continue 
to speak to the your like binder of information? <laughs> Yeah, so uh, I just have a doc. It's called GSA Action Plan. Um, and so, it, you know, it has a mission statement, a vision statement. It has a copy of our current norms and bylaws. It has uh, information about our officer structure and definitions of each position. Um, and like, obviously, if the next group of people wants to totally scrap it and change it, they can. I will be gone. It is up to them. Um, but then I, I've been really behind on it because I've been busy, so sorry about that. But um, <laughs> Yeah, I've just been going through and sort of listing like challenges that have happened and ways we've dealt with that. Um, I've been trying also just to keep track of like all of the events that we've done over the past four years in order to, you know, just have like a list and a record of that. Um, and so it's kind of just been, uh, um, it's like creating a history uh, just of everything that's happened in the club so it takes over next understands you know what it was they can choose what they want to keep and what they want to change yeah uh, i'm hoping to have elections for our next president mid-year next year that way i i can work with them one-on-one -on -one and we can actually discuss what's going on uh, either face to face or through video call, just to be able to chat to them, I feel would be very valuable. And then I'm also hoping to write up a document with easy access to our code of conduct, what we were already doing um, continuously, what we were planning to do, and then stuff we had already started but not finished. Um, during the summer, when um, the P previous leaders are kind of asking new people to join. We um, met up at a coffee shop and uh, both of them just went over kind of um, like ideas of what to do and how to kind of be a leader. And um, uh, they gave us a bunch of resources and they gave us their entire schedule for the last um, uh, the last year that they had planned because the two leaders had met up again over the summer and like planned out the whole year generally. And so me or the other leader and I had uh, did the same thing that year. And we just kind of planned everything out um, basically. And even though like things were bound to change and scheduling and whatever. Um, and this next year we're asking a couple more people to come help us so that um, we make more things happen. So it's not just two people trying to balance their school and leading the club and all that stuff. Um, and so we're gonna kind of do the same thing, either virtually or in person, just give them a rundown of what's expected of them and um, all the things that they will be doing. Uh, so what we do for my GSA is uh, because we're already starting with our vice president already elected at the beginning of the year, uh, for about three quarters of the year, the president primarily leads and is assisted by the vice president. And then towards the end of the year, what I do is that I let the vice president act more like the president and just make more decisions, plan their out their more, more of their own events. And if the vice president is already elected at that point, the vice president works with them and kind of learns by doing. I feel like that's often the best way of just handling anything in terms of leadership in my school system because it gives them a little bit of what they're gonna need to do before they actually go through with the entire thing. That's awesome. Y'all like have such different and unique ways of handling it, but they all sound really um, helpful for the people who are gonna be taking over. Um, so I do want to encourage our um, the folks who are on the webinar with us to ask any questions that y'all have in the chat at this point um, or the QA box. I don't care which I can, I'm monitoring both of them. Um, but ask any questions you have. Um, my last question for our panelists before we open it up to y'all, um, what does your self care look like these days? Um, and what kind of like self care and community care recommendations do you have for other student leaders? Uh, I've been playing a lot of music. I've picked up the ukulele again, which <laughs> doesn't sound like self-care, but it is for me. Um, I think also just get a shampoo or soap in your favorite scent. It, there's something about that. 
that's just really nice. Um, just do things you love. Do something artistic and creative as an outlet, and then also do something uh, to use the other side of your brain, whether it be science, math, just keep your brain active. Um, I agree. I've been doing also a lot of music and discovering new music, and I'm an artist, so I've been making art both for myself and for other people, so I just feel like I'm doing something productive and contributing even while I'm stuck at home. Um, I've been trying to go on daily walks to like both get away from my family and just also clear my head and enjoy nature for a little bit. <laughs> also been going on a lot of walks um just also like facetiming with friends and stuff has been super helpful for just like keeping me uh stable because i've been in a house with my parents who are like nice people they're great uh but it's a lot seeing the same people all the time so being able to interact with other people has been really helpful um just like maintaining good hygiene period um, you know, I think it can be difficult sometimes, especially when you get like caught up in the mundanity of everything, especially if you don't have to leave the house to do work or go to school or whatever. Um, so just making sure that, you know, you're taking a shower as often as you feel like you need to, all of that um, is really helpful. So. I definitely agree with just doing whatever makes you happy. I also, I play guitar, ukulele, and didgeridoo. So that has been kind of what I've been doing to keep myself in check. FaceTime with friends, and this is about to make me sound like a massive nerd, but um, I have friends who play D&D &D and they got me into it. So we meet up like every single Wednesday and play together. So that's primarily what I've been doing, but whatever makes you happy. Awesome, thank you all so much. Um, at this point, um, we can turn it over to um, audience member questions, if y'all have questions, or panelists, if y'all have questions for each other. Um, I know the having the space to talk with other student leaders can be really helpful sometimes, so definitely feel free to ask each other questions too. Uh, we've been continuing meetings through the summer through just voice chat on Discord. Have you guys been able to continue meetings at all through any software? Um, I tried to at least um, throughout the school year when it went virtual, but the um, the other leader and I just didn't have great communication. And so like I would text them and wouldn't get a response for a little while. And so it was just a lot of like internet and planning issues and all that kind of stuff. So we haven't been able to meet since school was in person, which is unfortunate because it's been a long time. Um, so hopefully we'll make up for that next year. Um, we had we had meetings via Google Meet um, at the beginning of like quarantine and stuff, um, and that was fine. But it was really it wasn't well attended um, because a lot of our members don't live in supportive homes, um, and so being able to talk about like clear stuff in a meeting wasn't really an option for a lot of people. Uh, we did have the option for them to just like interact via the text chat, but it's not the same. Um, and so we stopped those once the school year like officially ended, I guess. Um, there's still like a pretty good Instagram group going. There's just like a, a DM group chat. Uh, people send memes and TikToks and it's fine. Um, so that's been kind of like the way that we've been staying connected. Um, so I haven't been going on as much because I'm no longer part of uh, the leadership there, but uh, towards the end of the time that we were in school, we set up Zoom meetings and would meet same time we did back when we were in school and just talk about whatever we wanted to address. And some people would have presentations already made. And I kind of just addressed new leadership and how that was going to go. But that was primarily how we did it before we were kind of in an interesting situation. Awesome. Um, did Zoe, did you have <laughs> another question you wanted to ask? <laughs> um, yeah, if y'all um, don't have any other questions, then we can uh, 
wrap up and give you your time back. Um, but I really am so, so grateful for everyone uh, who joined us, for our student leaders, especially y'all are brilliant and amazing and inspiring. And I am so grateful to know you. Um, and I do want to give uh, folks the opportunity to um, give us feedback on this session. Um, I'm gonna put the feedback form in the chat. Um, and uh, we hope that we will see you on the next Queering Education session um, tomorrow at noon. Um, one of the faculty members at the University of Texas is going to uh, be doing a session called, You're Queer, You Graduated, Now What? Um, and so we definitely recommend y'all join that. Um, and we've got a number of other sessions this week happening as well. Um, thank you so much for coming out today and uh, take care of yourselves, drink more water and have a wonderful week. <laughs>